Hello there from uh, Croatia. Uh, okay, so as promised, I'm going to do a quick Q&A. Uh, I'm talking later on again at this, uh, it's the International Animal Welfare Conference uh, in Dubrovnik, uh, which is awesome and full of really positive doers that are helping dogs and cats, bless them, uh, within rescue over the world. It's amazing and meeting amazing people. So uh, if you can get to this, it happens every year, do it. It's organised by the Dogs Trust. Okay, so quick q and I think I'll do about 20 minutes or so. Uh, because I think I'm going to be needed back at the conference centre. Uh, thanks very much those that sent in the questions. I'll plough through as many as I can. They kind of came in two batches really. One, <laughs> quite technical, you geeks, uh, on certain uh, training aspects. And others, um, more kind of personal really. Uh, or for people that are setting themselves up. Um, maybe from running a business or from a motivation point of view. Uh, and also a few questions about the IMDT. So I will try and batch them, but it'll be a bit of a mix and match, I think. So, kicking off. There won't be any fancy editing or anything, so you will have to take what you're given. Uh, Ellie, Ellie asked a question. As a variable reinforcer is most effective way to maintain a behavior, does this mean that a clicker isn't a great tool for practicing behaviors the dog already knows? Uh, particularly for trick training and assistance dogs. Okay, a variable reinforcer for those of you that don't know is when we get a behavior from the dog, rather than reinforcing it every time the behavior is offered, which is called a continuous reinforcement, variable means it's, it's reinforced randomly, sometimes after the first attempt, sometimes after the third, sometimes after the tenth. Uh, putting the, the reinforcement schedule more on a kind of a fruit machine mentality. So the dog doesn't quite know when the reinforcer's gonna come, but the dog's got enough blind faith to keep offering that behavior because he knows sooner or later the reinforcer is gonna come. Behaviors that are on a variable reinforcement schedule, are they're more resistant to extinction, even if it's not being reinforced every time. Uh, it's harder for a gambler to walk away from a fruit machine than it is from a vending machine if both machines have decided not to pay out. So, the question being, should Ellie be using the clicker for behaviours that the dog already knows? No, not particularly. Uh, if the dog already knows, you don't have to be looking to mark and reinforce it every single time. What I would look at, Ellie, particularly if you are doing tricks and assistance dog works, where normally there's a chain of behaviors. It's not normally just one isolated independent behavior that happens uh, and you've got your result. It's normally this behavior, this behavior, this behavior, this behavior, and then the reinforcer comes. Look into back training. That's definitely the way to go. Uh, back training means that through training, oh, I've done three minutes already, oh my God. So uh, in training, we have a, a final behavior. We, we train and reinforce that first, then we bolt on the penultimate behavior that leads to the final behavior that leads to the reinforcement. Then we bolt on the third last behavior, then the penultimate behavior, then the final behavior that leads to the reinforcement. If you do that, then what happens is your cue for this behavior, the middle one, it not only cues the next behavior, but it reinforces the previously previous behavior. Only if you've trained using positive reinforcement. So when a dog hears the cue, the dog goes, yes, good news. A window of opportunity just opens. That's a secondary reinforcer. That works as a reinforcer. So, look into back chaining. Don't get too bogged down on variable reinforcement. Really set your criteria that you are gonna mark and that you are gonna reinforce. It may be your final behavior. It may be a particular standard within the individual behaviors. Uh, but back chaining's the way to go for very, very reliable sequence change of behavior and it's quite clever it's quite clever how the next cue reinforces the previous behavior and cues the next behavior it works like a glue okay Lisa asked um, why I became a dog trainer <laughs> how rude <laughs> uh, why I became a dog trainer and why I chose it as my profession because um, I am and always was and always will be obsessed it's, it's an obsession uh, I, I'm not really one that subscribes to oh, that person's a natural teacher or that person's a natural with dogs. 
I, I really don't subscribe to that. I, I just think if you're obsessed, which I am, and I'm guessing most of you are, then you'll do loads of it. And if you do loads of it, you'll get better at it. And if you get better at it, you'll get reinforced for doing it. And if you get reinforced for doing it, you'll do more of it. And this wheel keeps on rolling. It, it snowballs. So um, it's, it's not a profession, it's an obsession. Uh, and it always will be because there's always something to question. There's always something to polish, something to improve. Uh, and I love it. <laughs> Look where I am. Of course I love it. Okay. Emma asked on, <laughs> on behalf of a family member, how to deal with extreme aggression when the dog is resource guarding. Okay, this isn't something that I can responsibly advise on in a, in a quick Q&A. Uh, Emma, get a great trainer in. Um, look at the IMDT, find a trainer directory, or look for recommendations, or message me or email me and tell me where you're based and I'll see if I can find someone that can help you. In the short term, do no damage, um, like first aid really, just control and manage. Feed the dog in a completely separate room or out in the garden, don't interrupt the dog, let the dog finish, call the dog to you, give the dog a treat, close the door, pick up the bowl. Um, if there's particular resources, don't have them in the area until the trainer comes and helps you professionally. It's a two, three hour consultation with proper support and proper backup. And it would be remiss of me to um, try and give you a short answer because there isn't. Do it once and do it properly. Okay, Ruby asked, the best route to become a trainer? Um, okay, so listen, be obsessed. If you're not obsessed, do a different job. Uh, there's easier ways to make a living if you don't love it. Um, but embrace being obsessed if you can. Listen to others, but question every single thing. Um, don't, don't, be, don't be lazy. I don't mean physically, but mentally don't be lazy. Question every single thing that you read. Every bit of advice that you might get from a great trainer, if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. Or think and work it out until it does make sense. Or make your own brand, make your own version. Um, own everything that you do. Don't repeat everything you do. There's no point in repeating the same thing every year for the next 30 years. It's, it'd be bloody boring and, and you'll be rubbish. <laughs> Not you personally, Ruby, but anyone. So you should constantly evolve, constantly change, constantly question. Um, always think about what you're doing. Always, if you ask someone a question, think about it first. That's just kind of courtesy, really. Um, think potentials, think um, options. Come up with a couple of suggestions to your own question, then talk it through you'll get a lot more value out of your question rather than just asking a question and absorbing whatever's spewed back at you. Um, a lot of people that want to be dog trainers, um, either career-wise or relationship-wise or personally-wise or um, professionally-wise or monetary-wise, they're, they're always putting it off, always putting it off. And, and that's a shame because it'll never be the right time. I guess it's like having a baby or whatever. Um, there's never going to be a right time, just Lewis, Lewis Carroll it, just start at the beginning, keep going, finish when you get to the end, um, but start, start now, and do IMDT courses. Ka -ching. Okay, Ruby again, greedy, um, okay, uh, do I think IMDT will specialise in particular areas of education or remain broad? Dogs learn how dogs learn. Um, it's kind of not that complicated. Uh, if you understand how dogs learn, if you understand how to motivate behaviours, if you understand how to motivate the dog, how to reinforce behaviours, if you understand how to communicate with people and you're constantly looking to improve how you communicate with people and with dogs, then um, specific, broad, it makes no difference. Dogs and owners learn, dogs and owners get motivated, uh, dogs and owners um, do more of behaviour to get reinforced. Whatever that behaviour is, that's entirely up to you. But the rules are the same. So there's no need for INDT to become more specialised because um, there's no need to narrow that corridor. The rules are the same. You know, the ingredients are the same. If you get the ingredients, make up your own recipes. Specialise in your own recipes. So there. Uh, okay, Joe, 
asked if I could have any if I could have any breed one that I've not had before what breed would it be uh, yeah, I kind of I kind of not bothered <laughs> I like I like dogs I like dog souls I, I like being with dogs um, uh, the, the shape and size and color is not so important for me personally if I'm just looking to be hanging out with a dog uh, I think I you know I'd like to get old with a uh, Irish Wolfhound, I like the idea of uh, me getting grey and sedentary with another nice grey sedentary animal. Uh, so an Irish Wolfhound, sat in the garden, reading a book, me, not a dog. Uh, that's a nice picture. So yeah, I'll go Irish Wolfhound, plus Irish, hey, why wouldn't you? Begora. Okay, uh, Lorraine asked, uh, looking back at where I am now, <laughs> Sounds like I'm about to die. Uh, looking back at where I am now, what advice would I give to someone starting out other than doing IMDT courses? Okay. Uh, I think... I think... This has come up a lot recently on, on people that I've spoke to. Don't put too much value on being busy. There's too much... Yeah, there's too much kudos on people being busy. Who's, are you busy? Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, I ain't. Who wants to be busy? Um, work effectively. Don't don't look to work efficiently. Effic efficiently is is doing your work right. Effectively is doing the right work. And there's a massive, 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 massive difference. Um, I used to, and I've changed, and I'm, I'm constantly trying to improve. And it's a discipline that I need. But I see a lot of people that move one centimeter in a hundred directions every day. And they're, they're, they're all like little wasps. And tomorrow they have to do it again because I've only moved one centimetre. Effectively, working effectively is 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 going in one direction. Go, go in one direction a metre rather than a hundred directions in, in one centimetre. Um, that's how you'll become an expert. And if you're a dog trainer and you want to make your living training dogs, too right, your, your job is expert dog training dog behavior expert um and that's what you should be with a clear conscience if you're going to be taking people's hard-earned money um to work with their dogs and, and work well effectively with their dogs so aim to go in one direction per day and sacrifice everything else the other 99 directions will wait until tomorrow you know work on your list of priorities but by the end of the day you should have enough nourishment that you've learned something and you've improved something or a dog, or an owner's relationship, or your knowledge, um, don't just get through the day, because you'll only have to do it all over again, and you'll be exhausted. So uh, yeah, in a nutshell, too late, but in a nutshell, work effectively, not efficiently. Do the right work, rather than work right. Okay, Rosie asked, um, what's the top three things rescue should teach their dogs. So what's the top three things rescue centres should teach their dogs? Um, okay, so three things. I would I would love that um, rescue dog can come out the kennel and uh, the kennel staff can just sit on the floor or sit on a bench and the dog just learns to sit and w watch the world. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an amazing discipline. That, that's an amazing dog to spend time with that can just sit and watch, or just lay and watch. Traffic, other dogs, people, kids, birds, rabbits, rubbish, taking in different sights and sounds and smells, but watching. Um, and, and that's a skill that, that can be done and can be practiced, and just teaching a dog that when you come out the kennel, it's this low observatory kind of pace, as opposed to gorging. Um, as opposed to gorging and trying to get as much information as possible. Uh, so yeah, teaching a dog just to sit and watch the world go by would be amazing. Uh, from a, a, a more training point of view, teach eye contact, teach a dog, if in doubt, look up at the monkey. If you think there's something in it for you, look up at the monkey. If you want a cue, because a cue is good news, look up at the monkey. Um, so eye contact, uh, it's, it's the spine, it's the taproot that everything else spurs off. So um, eye contact is an awesome exercise for anyone, whether in rescue or not. And teach a dog uh, a nice settled mat. Uh, teach a dog to do a down and relax on a particular mat, 
the physical, tangible map that you bring out and about. So when a dog sees that, the dog can exhale. Um, it's the map for chewing on, it's the map for having your stuffed Kong on, it's the map for having your nice massage strokes on. You know, and use that as an anchor to help introduce the dog into other environments. So, sit on the floor with a handler, watch the world. Um, eye contact and a nice relaxing settle mat. I don't think we teach dogs to settle, but I think we can teach dogs that there's an opportunity to settle. Okay, Louise asked, is a variable reward, oh my, you lot with your variable stuff. Um, Louise asked, is a variable reinforcement schedule advisable for recall, or should I reinforce every time? Variable. Um, if you reinforce every time, then um, regardless of standard, <laughs> why, why try? Why would a dog, in fact, the, the behavior won't maintain, the behavior will deteriorate, because why, why run when I can jog? Why jog? when I can walk. Why walk when I can just dial it in? Um, you know, so you can go on a variable uh, so the dog maintains uh, a standard, more resistant to extinction as I said earlier, uh, or you can just reinforce your top set of criteria, okay? The dog gets back to me running non-stop, that will get a treat. Anything else below doesn't. It gets, uh, well done mate, better luck next time. <laughs> um, so either set a clear criteria that you know what it is, um, or go on a more variable. But don't continuously reinforce, because if I get paid, whether I do a good job, a bad job, or a indifferent job, sometimes I'm not gonna put in the full effort if the reinforcement's the same. So, there you go. Uh, and Louise asked another question. Um, what to do when an eight month old dog won't sit on cue, even though he knows the cue? First question, himself. Uh, make sure there's no soreness or anything. Um, secondly, I want to make sure that he's comfortable in the environment. Eight months, it's a wacky age. There's a lot, lot of fireworks going on in the dog's head normally at eight, eight months. So um, I would question, is the dog comfortable in the environment? Hang out in that environment 10 times in a row without asking any behavior. Get to the environment, there's some food here, mate. Get, get to the environment, there's food here. Get to, to the point where you can get to the environment, the dog's relaxed. Is he sensitized to that area? He's anticipating good stuff happens in this area, and then ask your sit. Now, chances are the performance will be a little bit performance. Uh, chances are the, uh, you'll get your sit. Uh, but if, even if you don't, that's all right. Tomorrow's another day. Um, cool. Stand. Don't obsess. Don't obsess about. I need a sit. Um, get to your area. Hang out in that area. Ask for your sit. If it happens, if it great, reinforce it. If it doesn't. Cool, there's nothing to reinforce, but just hang out there. You know, tomorrow's another day, it's not a race. Um, other than that, check your reinforcement value. Make sure it is as valuable to the dog as you think it is. Just play about with that. Um, bring different stuff, hand feed him, see what he goes for, see what he likes, see what gets the tail wagging, see what gets his pupils dilated, uh, and use that. Use the best reinforcement that you can, but don't sweat it. You know, there's bigger things in life. Uh, a down <laughs> joke okay Sarah asked uh, what's my opinion on what's my opinion on fear aggression with a dog that's guarding the owner okay that, that's a massive massive question again uh, probably quite uh, so many variables in there and probably needs a proper consultation but some questions maybe rather than labeling it fear aggression and, and that's cool uh, I'd be more interested in what's the behaviour, what's the body language, what behaviour are you seeing? Uh, what behaviour do you want instead? So at least that you've got a goal um, to work to, something measurable. Um, isolate the triggers. What makes the dog start the body language that suggests that he's not comfortable? Where, where's the threshold? What's the distance? Uh, is it men? Is it women? Is it kids? Is it people running? Is it people ambushing you? Um, you know, find out your, your, your apex of learning. Where, where the dog can be aware of the stimulus, i.e. people, uh, but not over aroused. That's where you need to start your training. Um, ultimately, when you start your training, you need to change associations to that stimulus or to that particular environment. When this happens in the environment, good stuff happens. Uh, teach the dog, you know, you suggest it's maybe fearful, stroke guarding. I'm not too sure if it's gonna be both. Um, 
But what's the function? What do you think the function of the behaviour is? Why are the dog's doing it? Is he doing it to get space between you two and the stimulus? If it is, teach him there's a cheaper way to get that space. Eye contact. Teach him, uh, when you look at me, I say, let's go. And we go, come away from the stimulus. That's a much cheaper, less embarrassing, uh, more energy efficient, calmer, relaxed, controlled way to put space between him and the stimulus. So teach, teach, teach eye contact like a beast. Um, change the associations, maybe some kind of management and control sort of type behaviors such as let's go. So if it does get on top, you see your dog not looking comfortable, let's go, turn, walk away, feed as you walk away. Uh, so it's gonna stop you having to tighten up on the lead uh, so the dog isn't losing his flight option. Uh, so lots of things, but what's the behaviour, what do you want instead, isolate the triggers, change the associations, load of control and management, don't put you or him in a situation that you're not ready to cope with. Um, holistically, look to improve the dog's confidence uh, in lots of different environments, things like shaping, so the dog's being proactive, getting results, learning how smart he is, making his own living. Uh, these are all good to improve the dog's confidence. Uh, maybe teach other behaviours such as a touch, like a target touch. Maybe on like on um, on our Tupperware lid. So teach a dog to touch that. When a dog sees that, he's got good happy associations. Oh cool, I know what to do. Confidence. I go and touch it, I get something good. Um, nice consequence to the behaviour. Plus a nice happy, conditioned emotional response so he feels good when he sees it because you know the good stuff's coming. If you can, that's gonna extend his fuse. That's gonna extend his tolerance. Then you can start doing that behavior with a person near you at a safe distance, reduce that distance, eventually hand over that Tupperware so the dog can go to them, nose touch, come back to you to get the good stuff. It, 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 it puts a nice control on how long the dog's gonna be at the stranger. It's gonna take away the confusion. The dog's gonna know exactly the, the behavior to offer here. And dog knows if I do that, it's associated with getting good stuff. Win-win, but don't, don't push it. Okay. And ultimately, let your dog know that you've got his back, um, which is a confidence thing as well. Let him have confidence in you. And that, that means getting him out of dodge. That means um, not letting people ambush you. Okay, Jen asked, where do I see myself and the IMDT in five years time? I don't know. Um, uh, IMDT, <laughs> IMDT is going nowhere. Uh, the IMDT is the IMDT is a rock now. So that's 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 a consistent, and that's only going to magnify um, because it's um, it's got great credibility and and more importantly, it's got um, great people associated with it. Uh, it's got awesome uh, membership that all have because of the assessment process, they've all got the right ethics, and they're good trainers. Um, the purpose of the IMDT is to, was to help create, maintain, provide good trainers with good ethics. Um, both really important, really important, and not, no, no one of those two things is more important than the other. Um, there's, there's some people that have awesome ethics. We'll never use punishment. Crap trainers though. You know, it exists. Uh, owners ultimately want help for their dog. Owners ultimately want their dog trained. The ethics is something that we can drive once we've got a foot in the door. We'll get our foot in the door when we deliver results and, and, and we've got good reputation and everything else. So um, it's really important that we have good ethics, but it's also really important that we can deliver results, measurable, manageable, manageable results. And that's what the IMDT does and, and always will do. Um, I'm never gonna be far away from the IMDT. So, uh, yesterday, for example, I, I signed up to go to Japan. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be working in Japan uh, next year uh, on the rescue side of things. From a personal point of view, uh, the rescue is, is uber important to me. I'll probably do more and more along that side of things. Um, but I'll always, I, <laughs> I'll always do what I want to do. That sounds really horribly arrogant. But 
the reason I'll do what I want to do is because I'll that's that's what I'll be best at. Um, and I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. And uh, why wouldn't I do what I'm strongest at? Um, because if, if I do what I'm strongest at, the, the results multiply. If I try, if, if, if I concentrate on my weaknesses, I'll raise my criteria and at best I'll hit average. I'm much better working with people that are better at that stuff than me. Um, and, and, and we all work to our strengths. So, uh, yeah, IMDT, it's gonna stick to the same premise, it's going nowhere, it's gonna supply good ethical trainers <laughs> to the world, and, and it's a simple premise that works, so we're not gonna change it. Okay, Michael asks, what's your normal work day? What does your normal work day look like? It never looks the same. Um, extremely variable, uh, thankfully, because, um, Keeps life interesting. I do have some consistencies. Uh, okay. Uh, so every day, every day I, I meditate, 10 minutes, no more. Um, and I use an app called uh, Headspace. Um, or I'll just do it off my own back. <laughs> Not literally. Uh, just to clean the canvas. Really, just uh, to, to, to purge my tank uh, if I was a scuba diver, just, uh, just to clean the palette and then I can start afresh. And again, it, it, so I'll, I'll always meditate uh, and I swim every day. Um, just physical exercise is essential. Uh, it should be on every adult's curriculum, I think, from a mental health point of view, um, but also from a, well, obviously, just from a physical health as well. Um, so I swim every day, I meditate every day, um, I'm much better from a work perspective that I, I batch my work now. So again going back to this 100 centimetre movements, such as emails, emails I would always cut, check emails and always try and answer emails and, and, and think that's working efficiently and it was but it wasn't working effectively because it may take me 30 seconds to answer an email but I'll think about it for 10 minutes after. 15 minutes after uh, which is silly so you know you don't do your laundry one sock at a time you wait until you have a laundry basket and then you do that's that's, that's effective work um, and it should be the same uh, for any work I think so and also from a work perspective I prioritize much better than I used to um, I'll do a list uh, no more than four things that are important and I'll prioritize uh, number one and my target for the day is to do number one. Uh, if I can do anything else, that's a bonus, but they'll still be there tomorrow. Um, so I work out what's most important. Sometimes it's do the job that's gonna relieve the most stress. You know, maybe that's how I'll prioritize. Uh, but that's, that's, again, that's just working effectively. Um, so I'll work from my list. I'll, I'll, um, I'll set myself a target of what's gonna get me to the end of the day effectively. I'll do that one job. Um, I'll procrastinate as little as possible. Um, and then I'll make a list for tomorrow. And that list won't change. I'll, I'll, I'll work from the top of that list um, come tomorrow morning. Other than that, the rest is all rhubarb. Okay, uh, <laughs> anonymous email. No, not an anonymous email. Yeah, an anonymous email. Although I can look up your email address and find out so um, okay this one was how do we stop certain <laughs> okay how do we stop certain trainers with questionable methods promoting themselves what could you be thinking about um, we don't I don't um, it would put me in a wrong I don't know I, I, I want every you know, an IMDT ethos is, is to be proactive, to be positive, to do, um, not to walk around with placards saying don't. That's that's fine, you know, I know if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem and all that. But being a solution for me is 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 trainers should lead by example, deliver results using good ethics. Um, there's loads of space out there, there's loads of airspace out there. And it's there for the taking. 
and either the bad guys will grab it or the good guys can grab it. If the way good guys are trying to grab the airspace by poo-pooing the bad guys, how ineffective is that? You know, what a waste of time, how miserable. You know, it doesn't, if I read someone slagging off another trainer, that doesn't motivate me. But if I see a trainer doing good stuff and delivering results, that motivates me. I'll share that. I'll never share anyone slagging off anyone else. I had 50 to 100 personal messages on Facebook last week. Steve, is there anything we can do about stopping a certain dog trainer coming and, and doing their dog training show in London? <laughs> sorry but I've just got to delete it because that's not healthy for me because that's going to put me in a negative anti frame of mind and um, man it's boring as well so just don't look over your shoulder lead by example crack on the airspace is there you're either going to grab it or they're going to grab it it's up to you get on with it <laughs> um, yeah don't bang don't don't bang the anti drum bang the pro drum okay and Last question, hitting the 30 minutes. Sorry, anyone's still there? Fair play to you. Um, okay, last question, uh, another anonymous one. Uh, one piece of advice for fellow dog trainers. Oh, cool. So, one piece of advice for a fellow dog trainer that sometimes has highs and lows. Um, and I'm seeing a, a lot with, with, with trainers, but that's my world, so that's what I'm looking at. That's my algorithm I'm surrounded by. But dog trainers that are just, I don't know, burning out or, or, or suffering from depression and um, have extreme highs and extreme lows, etc. Uh, and emotional burnout and compassionate burnout. And I don't know if that's specific um, or, or exclusive in any measure to dog trainers. But I do get trainers to contact me that sometimes they're struggling for motivation and how do you know how do you stay so motivated and how can I maintain motivation? I don't. I don't think anybody does. I think it's the wrong sort of target motivation. You can't guarantee it. Um, it, it comes to you and it and it and it leaves you. But what you can guarantee, so therefore you can control it and own it, is discipline. Things like that list, things like I'm only going to look at my emails 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Um, I'm only going to do one job. I'm only going to work going one direction today. That's discipline. That's not motivation. Um, when motivation comes, grab it and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a crest of a wave. Um, but discipline will keep putting you in the water so you've got a chance of catching the crest of the wave. So be disciplined. Be, be regimented. Kind of boring stuff really. Um, but I can guarantee you can be disciplined every single day and the day that you're having a low discipline will get you to do that one job motivation won't so um, own your discipline have your discipline <laughs> do your meditation clear your decks tomorrow's another day don't sweat it I'm sure you're doing a good job um, yeah and take a day off man because um, we're not on the planet long enough to sweat the small stuff. Okay, um, that's me done. Hopefully, it's uh, hopefully you got something from it. If not, sorry for wasting your time. Look at the blue sky. Uh, and if it's been useful or you want me to do any more, um, please just message. I uh, just stick it up on Facebook. Um, then everyone can massage my ego as well as myself. And uh, if it's been useless, tell me as well. Um, and I'll do something else instead. Okay, uh, have a good day. Love you. Bye.